Welcome to episode six of This Catholic Life. Conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical, and joyful. Today's show is Work and Life, a conversation about whether we work to live, live to work, does work have any significance beyond the paycheck, or is it just for our survival or wealth? I'm your host, Peter Holmes. Today I'm joined by Renee Cole Ryan, my co host and professor in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. Welcome, Renee. Thank you, Peter. Good to have you back. And Cormac McCann, philosopher, sports fan, uh, connoisseur of the finer things of life, and especially um, welcome back after a short period of illness. Thank you. I'm glad to be alive. (laughs) We're glad you're alive too. Before we dive into today's topic, um, we want to just check out what's happening through the week. What have you been up to, Renee? Um, People keep on asking me that, and I sort of look at them. Someone came into my office yesterday and said, so how did it go? And I said, what? Which (laughs) thing are we talking about here? And he said, well, you were in Fremantle last week. Oh, yes, I was in Fremantle. So Fremantle is over the other side of the country. I flew in there on a Thursday and then flew out on the red eye on a Friday night so that I would be back with my family on Saturday. We're still tossing up whether that's a good work-life balance thing to do. Yeah, I was just saying this is an appropriate topic, isn't (laughs) it? He pointed out that I was there in body, but he wasn't sure if I was there in many other ways. Yeah, because for those of you who haven't done that flight, that's that's a fair distance. How long is the flight? Well, the flight on the way back was only three and a half hours. Only three and a half hours. (laughs) But um, it was five hours over there, three and a half hours back. But the issue is that you get on the plane at midnight over in Perth and then land at 6.30 in the morning. So with the time change and everything, it was a bit ugly. Yeah. Well, what about you, Cormac? What have you been up to? Well, it's a funny question because, you know, I'm one of those people where someone asks you, oh, what have you been up to this week? And my mind instantly goes blank. Yes. (laughs) Does anyone have that? Yes, that's exactly me. I don't know. I don't know what did I Did I do anything? I, I I'm sure I did. Just give me a minute. <laughs> and luckily, you, you know, gave me fair warning that I would have to answer this question about what I've been up to so I could think. And fun uh, thing I'd like to share today is this afternoon, I am going to pick up the published version of my thesis. Woo-hoo! Oh, well done. And a very nice yeah. thesis it is too. Well, Renee can say that. She's uh, <laughs> pretty much responsible for the quality. <laughs> Over, <She's... laughs> I know. <laughs> Good I can't stuff. really take credit, to be honest. <laughs> yes, you Even the university yes, told me what colour it had to be. Oh, uh, really? Did they? Yeah, they're very it's strict. Blue. Yeah, it, is, it is blue. Blue and gold, right. like Notre Dame. There you go. That's right. I think mine was that as well, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I've gone to the step of publishing yet. All right. Okay. So today's topic, work and life. So it sounds like we've both had, um, sorry, but both, all of us have had something to do with work and life. Uh, when I told my wife this was the topic today and she said, well, hopefully you'll get some hints from the others. <laughs> Good luck with that, Susan. Yes, that's right. <laughs> one, one of the interesting um, issues about uh, talking about work life when uh, I'm actually I am actually diagnosed (laughs) by my psychologist as a workaholic. So she said, you actually have a problem. And I I once was talking to a priest about this and I said, I have this Protestant work guilt thing. If I'm not working, I feel guilty about that I should be. And now I've got, now I'm a Catholic, I've also got Catholic moral guilt. As in, (laughs) I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing that. And, um, And just to be clear to the listener, these things and these things are actually not proper to Christianity in the sense of mm. disproportionate guilt over things when you actually have things in balance is not a good thing. It's not a, a healthy thing. Uh, but he thankfully told me, well, I'm a Catholic and I have neither of those. And it, in fact, my problem is that I don't feel guilty about anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> But can you talk about how they do conflict? Because is it that the moral guilt um, is being guilty that you are working too much and the person uh, guilt that you're not yeah, working no, enough? It's funny. How it works? Catholics have never made me feel guilty about my work. Okay. Um, About not doing enough or doing no, too much? No, or, I've never yeah. never had the pressure. And I work for Catholic organizations. Um, they make me feel guilty about spending money um, in their organization, but they've never made me feel guilty about what work. Oh, about like. spending the organization's money. Yes, that's right. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, but but not anything else. So uh, it's funny, though, that as a Protestant, we you just there's almost an immorality to getting anything for free or getting getting any kind of handout from anyone else. It was it was like you couldn't accept anything from anyone. Was it almost insulting? Um it was a it was a shame mm. to have to take because a handout sort of thing. It. And mm. you, yeah, and so mm. if you'd had to work for it, it was like that was okay. And people would 
pride themselves in how busy they are. I think we're seeing this more and more in society. People yeah. pride themselves. It's almost like a badge of honor. I'm so busy. I, do, I don't know how I'm going to fit this in. I'm yeah. so busy. And it's, it's, apparently busyness is some kind of virtue when in fact it probably indicates we're either not good at organizing our time or not good at saying no to people we should say no yeah, to. Yeah, that's mm. right. And, and a lack of ability to prioritize. So you get a sense when people say, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, there's a lot of wheel spinning going on yeah, and not so much self-reflection yeah. about what's really important in life. And I think that that's actually adding a lot. I see that happening um, with friends, colleagues, students, that they, they're so focused on being busy and appearing busy yeah. that they're not actually able to tell themselves that it's okay yeah. to settle back and, and also, reflect a bit more. It becomes yeah. reactive too yeah. because it, it, there's the whole, I mean, this might be a bit too simplistic, but there's the whole adage of what's important and what's urgent. Mm. And, and some things are important but not urgent and other things are urgent but not important. And so the phone rings and who, well, we don't know who it is, but let's say the phone rings and I know it's a conversation that's actually not essential to have right now. My kid's here and they, they want to play with me. That's important. It has, you know, it has significance for their whole yeah, life, yeah. but it's not urgent in the sense that it has to happen at that moment. You know what no, I mean? I understand that. And yeah. so we end up, I think if we're reactive, end up making decisions which are more about what's urgent, what's what people are bothering us about at that time, rather than what's actually we've prioritized quite deliberately to do, which is probably a good way to get into the topic a bit more deeply. So what what is work? When we talk about work-life balance, what is work? Because I think there's actually a little bit of a gray area. We tend to think of work as something we get paid for. Um, yeah, that's how I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. But um, we get paid for work, but then there's things which, I mean, Renee and I would know this, and I'm sure you've come across this, Cormac. There's some things that we kind of, are kind of related to our job because pretty much we live our job, but that might be that we go and speak somewhere at an yeah. event or something. Uh, yeah, and yeah. it's out of ours, so we're not technically getting paid for it in that sense. Well, we're not technically at all. We're not getting paid for it. <laughs> but we do it either because we, we're, we're well, committed to the event. Processed account or something like that. Well, yeah. <laughs> technically, I wasn't bad, <laughs> yeah. but here are the yes. details of my Cayman Islands account. Thank you. It's a very small island with my offshore account. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a... But at least you own it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but the... Um, and so there's there's activities you do which are kind of like para work processes. And then there's things you do because you love it, like it's volunteer stuff or you're involved with your parish or you're involved with a particular organization. And, but it's still a duty, like you've committed yourself to something yeah, like serving on a committee. That work? Would you call it work? Like if someone said, what are you doing? I'm going to work. It's like I'm going to clean yeah, the I parish think, hall or something like that. I think if would we're talking about it, I would if we're talking about work-life balance. So, because okay. my, I mean, and this is, I th maybe I'm wrong here, but I think when I talk to most other people about life in the question of work life, what they mean is the time I have for me and my family yeah. is my life mm. or my, my recreation like sport or something. And they kind of, and this is what I'm saying about it being gray. It's not just the time I spend at work, but it's also the time I've committed to things which take away from my recreation time. Mm. Yeah. I, I just have a bit of a problem with this whole idea of work life as though we're working with some kind of dualism here. I was <laughs> hoping you were going to yeah, jump in so, I'm like, there's something wrong about I this, know, but I need a wise philosopher to say something. The first time I heard this, you know, someone said to me very seriously, I'm really having issues with my work life balance. Right. And I thought, really? I mean, what does that even mean? So mm -hmm. if you're an academic, then you're always thinking and you're always engaging with ideas and whether you're talking with your kid or with one of your students or a colleague, there's always something going on, you know, reading on trains and do I say if I'm reading something that yep. I might then bring up in class, like I read a book recently that I didn't realize I was going to be talking about mm. in class with my students later on. Well, was I actually working when I was reading that book would, on the train or, yes. or not? But I wouldn't. I'd say that's so much part of my life and who I am sure. that I also have great difficulty with the idea of me time. I think that that is so destructive because I've just seen so many women of my generation who have said, well, now I need me time right. and me time mm. will be go away, everyone. Right. I don't want my kids around me. I don't want my spouse near me. I might go out with some of my girlfriends, but I'm probably going to go to a, this is not me at all, yeah. by the way, but go to a beautician's parlor or go, you know, and have a very, um, very, very focused me time lunch. It's and all, it will be all about really. me. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I just think that, so I read about this somewhere where someone was saying, if you need to escape from your life, 
that much, you need a new then life. maybe what you need to do <laughs> is readdress your life yeah, and right. see how it is that your work. Okay. And like, so I, I really have issues just with the whole idea of a work life balance as though yep. they're two separate things. Let me put it this way. Um, for me, the work life balance is how I'm accessible to my family. So yeah. mm. if I'm working at work, they can't get to me because I'm at work and they can send me an email or they can call me, you know, if they really need to, but they know generally speaking to leave me alone at work because unless they really need me, they can. But um, when I'm at home, even there, there's times, especially because I'm working on a thesis, they, they have to kind of leave dad alone kind of thing. And for them, work life becomes a very clear thing. You know, I can do this with dad on Saturdays. I can do this, you know, there's a... And I have to confess, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at sort of allowing them to bring come into the various aspects of my life um, and be functional, basically. Mm. So, And I think once the thesis is done, that will have to be readdressed very carefully. But it's still it's, – I think it's a big deal. And for me, it's not about me getting time by myself, although a few moments to breathe isn't, isn't a bad thing. Mm. It's more about having time that I can give – myself to friends and family and things yeah. like that. And and it's not just about the time in some respects. Sometimes I have to, on the way home, uh, I, instead of getting picked up from the, the bus stop corner, I will ask to walk for the 20 minutes just to get my head in the right oh, space. And I get so annoyed <laughs> if I see someone who knows me during those 20 minutes. Oh, I really count yeah, on those yeah, 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, there's someone I have to talk mm, to now mm. and I'm not in the mood to talk. I actually need yeah. those 20 That's minutes. Yeah, it's funny because you it's kind a transition, of count on isn't those. It, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so interesting kind of decompressing all this. And, and getting geared up. I yeah. used to drive home from work before I worked at Notre Dame and – and I would literally park a, a street away from the home and, and sit in the car and breathe, just breathe for about 10 minutes just to get all – so I wasn't carrying all the crap from work into home just yeah. so I could give mm. myself properly yeah. to home. These are useful things here because obviously I've got young children who are still trying to figure this all out. Like we're just off yep. the back of me finishing my master's as I mentioned yep. earlier. And so – and, you know, my wife is very good at saying, oh, okay, yep, I'll, we'll give you the time on the Saturday mornings and all that. You've got sure. to go and study that kind yeah. of thing. And now they're in this, 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 you know, phase where, okay, I don't have to study anymore, but how do we, you know, establish, you know, how the normal family routine is yep. going to operate. So it's interesting hearing both these perspectives, yeah. you know, work-life balance isn't a thing, but work-life balance well, is a thing. Well, it isn't, <laughs> Yeah, right? but, yeah, because yeah. it's interesting to hear because I'm like, well, <laughs> how do we do it? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Sure yeah, as hell, right. not doing it that great at the moment. Yeah. Well, can I say we'll a couple of things there? You see, use the word normal, which you can just just take that one out of your vocabulary there with family no and throw normal. it away <laughs> because normal is whatever works today. Mm. Um, however, you do want to set habits. Now, one of the mistakes that we made early on was to say, once we're done with this particular crisis, we will get back to normal. Oh, that sounds like us at the moment. Yeah, it's it, like, it, we just need to get to here. Oh, yeah. Come Thursday, it'll all be fine. But something else is going to happen on Thursday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then it does. And you're like, oh. Basically, you, you just don't count on anything. Anyway. You don't yeah. count on anything except that you're constantly going to have to decide what your normal is and work mm. towards it. And even when you've decided it, you then have to reassess it every week or so and go, uh, you know, is this a rational yeah. sort of thing? Is, is it possible? Okay. Am I putting too much on myself? Uh, in in the art of the possible, I've heard that phrase, politics is the art yes, of the possible. Yes, Pretty that's much true. that's family life, I think. However, let's let's just take a step back. We're, we're all very fortunate in that we have work to go to and, that, and we have work that can support our family. We have to say that work-life balance is actually a privilege. Yeah, absolutely. It's an amazing privilege yeah, yeah, to have true. work, to, to actually, you know, have to have this balance. There are people who would dearly love to have uh, work to, to any kind of balance and, in fact, I guess I wanted to address this. In times when people are desperate for work, they're much more vulnerable to a an employer exploiting that desperation, mm. which means that their work-life balance isn't respected. And often, and I shouldn't say this, but I've worked in many, many different organizations. In some of them, the answer I've got when I've tried to push the family side of the work-life balance has been, if you don't like the conditions here, feel free to find a job where they give you that kind of luxury. Luxury. Yes. Oh. And the word mm. luxury is, you know, having a family apparently. Wow. And, and part of it is that if you only judge the um, the value of a worker based on uh, what the company gets out of you literally from day to day instead of the value of their whole person to the company, mm. then, then the person who's single and is sort of – has extra time or perhaps uses they they have poured themselves in 
to the company is always going to look like a better um, employee, employee, employee yeah. and that's how than the person who has it? a family. That's how so yeah. many corporations are structured these days. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you can even go, it's very easy to hop across. I mean, I was in the Philippines recently and very easy to see that worker exploitation there because it's just, you know, in your so face all the time. So many poor yeah. people. But yeah. uh, one of the interesting things, I was visiting family over there and they're not, you know, you don't need to be wealthy. You just have to be, you know, not as poor as the really poor people and then you can employ them. Right. Pay them next to nothing kind of yeah. thing because there are just no worker protection or anything. There are so many people. So labor right. is cheap. Yeah. I mean, the Philippines' largest export is actually people. Right. It's labor. Um, and one of the things that they do in the Philippines is uh, they everyone has a driver. Yep. So people volunteer, to, they get paid to be the driver and none of them can afford to live in the really uh, expensive parts of the city. So for example, Manila, you yep. got to think of uh, as being designed in a series of like concentric circles where in the center of Manila, all the wealthy people live. Right. And then the next draw a circle around that, so like fenced off security and everything like that is the next lot of wealthy people. And then you get poorer and poorer and poorer yep. as you draw out with circles. And all so the way where do the their extremes, drivers come from? All the way out. Wow. And not only do they come from so far away, there's really no public transport. Right. They, they've, they've got to get themselves into mm. their employer's area. So they have to live near their employer. Typically the employer will house them. Yep. And they'll stay there for sometimes a couple of weeks on end. Right. And then they'll be allowed once they've earned enough to go back by public transport, the several hours it takes to go and see their family for a day or two. Right. This sounds like the industrial revolution, really. I mean, the yeah. whole, the, the, the tragedy of wasn't so much, I mean, there's huge advances in all sorts of ways in society, but the tragedy of separating family with work. And mm. this is something that comes up in um, my thesis work a little bit. The impact on males and females and families and everybody in, and whole villages and societies from pulling people away from local community into work. And we, we take that for granted now. I read um, it was only a couple of... Um, about last week that we saw an article in, oh gee, it was a whole bunch of papers saying that the average commute in Sydney was um, 83 minutes or something like mm. that, or 77 across Australia. That's mm. the average commute wow. for workers. Now, that's because we've got enough technology to get to and fro places very fast. We can't walk. Uh, we have to use public transport. But I know some people who have to make, choose their work very carefully because they can't afford even the public transport to get to work or or the the amount of time that it takes to go by bus or whatever. So even here in Sydney, we have people who, who just don't have this privilege and they don't have the access, if you like. If we get to the stage where, and it seems this way, that families are more and more moving away from the center of cities because it's simply not family friendly, we're going to find that, and if the works, like especially our kind of work, Renee, mm. stays in the cities, we're going to find this more and more that there's there's a kind of a, a, a huge difficulty for someone who wants to have a family getting into the places mm. where there's work. Um, there is a, the Catholics have something to say about this, the whole justice of work, that it actually has to be about the support of the family. Uh, this is my question. Let's say I can go away from my family all week and bring home an amazing salary and they've got everything they want. That doesn't happen, by the way, but let's, let's pretend for a second that I can. Um, would it be an – is that really about my family? Is it is it me providing what my family needs? I don't think it is because money is only one aspect of what I need to provide for my family. The, the most important aspect is their father. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah that presence of the parents yeah. in the home is something. something – so besides obviously all of the work, the Catholic social teaching that's gone on around this area, so Leo the Thirteenth, in particular with Rerum Novarum pointing out the problems of both socialism and capitalism. Yep. Uh, and I was reading a commentary on this recently <laughs> where it was pointed out that, they, that, the, that the, um, the capitalists look at everything that he says about the evils of socialism and the socialists look at everything that he says about the evils of capitalism and they don't actually put the two together. Yes. No, they Which never really do, do they? The commentary yeah. is always about, well, the the other, that's right. The other yeah. thing they do is as soon as you say there's something wrong with capitalism, they go, socialist. Yeah. And if you say there's something wrong with socialism, they go, oh, capitalism yeah. is bad. Yeah. Instead yes. of trying to find the balance. And yes. I know that um, John Paul II made a uh, – I'm pretty sure that that I read this. <laughs> it's one of those things I read. I, can fact I read check this you, Renee, somewhere. It's all right. Yeah, that's right. You you be my fact checker there on, right. on JP two. I'll be like the ABC. Um, yeah, that's right. He pointed out that when he was in the um, when he was in Poland, 
uh, and suffering under communist oppression in Poland and was very involved in the solidarity movement for workers and all of this kind of thing. Um, at the same time, he was very aware that there was a an attack on the family through work that was happening because the idea was that if you could keep the family apart through making the parents work so that they were never actually together, all together at the same time and in the same place, mm. then that was one of the best ways to have control over everyone mm. in the society Yes, um, because families wouldn't be banding together and supporting each other and giving each other the love and the nourishment in all sorts of ways sure. um, that they could. They wouldn't be able to live out their religious faith in as strong a way as they might have been able to otherwise. So because this was actually a get... deliberate attack What's through yeah. work on the family. And I think that's something we need to be aware of in a capitalist society now mm. that is actually focusing so much on how much you're bringing home with your paycheck and not not so much on, and that m might relate back to more to what we're saying, not so much on how it is that we are being with our families and being with our broader communities and giving that kind of support. We are terribly materialist yes. in Australia. It's all about the paycheck. It's all about, you know, what do you do or how much do you earn? Do you own a house? I know we're going to talk about that in yes. a future podcast. You know, this is, these are some of the greatest factors that are going on instead of, you know, what great ideas have you had recently? Yep, Tell yep. me about your kids. Um, what's your, what are you, reading? you know, what are you reading? Yeah. Have you but seen anything the question you get asked. Have you it's listened like, to a good podcast What do you do for work? Lately? It's what's your name and what do you do for yeah, work? And that's if you're right. Victoria, who do you support in the AFL? Like, yes. Which is not a relevant question if you're from New South Wales. <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> Sorry. If We're there are going to have Victorian a whole podcast listeners, on this, Cormac. Know, it's on the Talking Battle of the Codes. Talking to Victorians. Yeah. There's a good, there's a good um, example. I actually did not realise that. <laughs> <laughs> I just say something yes. terrible. Yeah, I'm deeply offended. I couldn't care less about AFL, actually. Oh, that's So it's okay. <laughs> so However, <laughs> Peter may be of a different view. I don't well, know. We can discuss this at a later date. <laughs> we can pick this up. But I wonder if either of you have heard of um, Denmark's trial of the four-day working week. How has that been working out? Well, I think uh, I actually tried to find out some information about how it's progressing and the articles I found weren't all that informative. So I can't give you a definitive answer mm. to that question. Right. But I can summarize the the main idea behind the, the four day working week and the, the whole idea that the, what, what, what do we call someone from Denmark? Are they Danish? Yes. yes. Right. Yes. There you go. Cause I get really confused with all these yeah. people. Anyway. You were just thinking pastry, weren't you? Yeah, that's right. So I was like, is that a thing? Okay. <laughs> morning maybe tea. it's a thing. Yeah. Is it morning tea time? No. Okay. Uh, and the idea is that if you can have your people working a shorter work day, but maximize their productivity in that six hour window rather than a seven and a half or an eight hour window. Yep. You can send them home earlier. They can get more time with their families. They come back to work better rested. Mm. Yes. They enjoy life more. Yep. They're more productive, therefore. Uh, and your economy, actually, they found, yep. runs more efficiently. Not yeah. less, not even equal, yep. more efficiently. So this is the question. It, it, do I mean, there's been numerous studies I've read to show that an eight-hour day is actually an unrealistic expectation, and there's almost nobody who can produce eight productive hours every day. Thank Australians Europe. for that. We, we're responsible for the eight-hour day. Uh, well, we can talk about that. But there, right, there's right. – um, <laughs> there, well, the Ford Motor Company in the 1950s, I think, was the first one to introduce the, um, the two-day weekend in, in okay. modern times, and, and the eight – 888 idea started to spring from that. We were actually slightly behind the US in putting the 888 in, in place. Well, the guy I recently read it was like Australian miners or something like that who yeah, made the, that. But In terms of federal law, yes, okay. we were the first to do that. But yeah. in the US, they were doing it like they do in the US everywhere. They, everywhere all they sorts start, of different yeah, places yeah. did different so things. So much more efficient. <laughs> but, so that's subsidiarity in theory. Um, but the question is, I've worked in several places uh, where – they didn't ask me about specific hours. They said, get the job done. Mm. Now, that can work for you because if you get the job done, you can, you can you know, if you're fast working, you can get it done and go home. Or it can work against you if you've got my problem with workaholism because if there's no specific parameters on when you go home, mm. I, I just keep working. And quality of output as well. Yes. Because if you're a perfectionist as well, then you're going to just keep tinkering with it. Keep yeah, that's right. Keep revising it. That's my yeah. problem. I'm a perfectionist. So um, Couldn't tell. constantly people say to me, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah, and I have on my wall at home a G.K. Chesterton saying, now you have to take it in the context of me being a workaholic and a perfectionist. The, the quote is G.K. Chesterton saying, if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And it's typical of him to flip a, a yeah, common saying right. on its head, meaning yeah. that if it's worth doing, have a shot. Even if it's not going to be perfect, have a shot at oh, it. That's what he means. Do okay, it yes. hard. And yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. I'm not a great, you know, I'm not great at being a dad in lots of different circumstances, but they, I'm still the dad they've got. Give it my best shot. Even if I stuff it up, it's still better than not trying at all. Mm. So in other words, if it's worth doing, just do it. Don't yeah. don't let the perfect stop, having to be perfect, stop you from having a go. And um, coming back to the work-life balance thing, I think that um, my problem is, is that when I'm my own boss in terms of time management, I, I'm more ruthless with me than my boss would be in that sense. You know, mm. Do you know what I mean? And there are other people who are the other way. You know, I've actually worked with people who had no time frames. All they had to do was produce the work. And after about a year or so, we had to say, can you point to anything you've done? Um, <laughs> so it becomes a real issue in terms of management because yes. management yeah, yeah, is actually does. more of an art than a science when you're working within those Very parameters. Much so, yeah. you need to be able to have that interpersonal relationship yep. with your um, – so I'm speaking of someone who's, who's the head of a faculty. You know, if, with some people, I kind of need to say – give them a bit of a nudge and say, yep. so I haven't seen so much of you lately. What's what's going on, yep. you know? And, you know, <laughs> have, have you finished that thing I gave you to do a couple of months ago? Mm, you yes. know, where are we with that? And with others, mm. the gentleman to my left being a case in point, <laughs> I'm right. sort of going down the hallway at 7 o'clock at night and saying, go home. Don't you have a family? Yes. Go home. You know, don't come in first thing tomorrow morning, whatever the, you do. The security um, come guard. Come in a bit late. Yeah. The security guard at work actually came into my office to check the lights um, last month. Uh, he said, your light's stuck. And I said, no, it isn't. He said, yeah, every time I come past, it's on. I yeah, said, no, I'm, just, I'm, I'm in. just in the office. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't left since last month. That's right. So. When you when you know all of the, well, we do tend to know anyway, the, all of the security people and all of the cleaners, mm. but when you really know the security <laughs> yeah, guys yeah, and yeah, the cleaners, yeah, 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 that's yeah. when you know you've kind of got a problem. Yeah, yeah, well, whenever we get a new security guard, he switches on all the um, the alarms early. Yeah. Like, and when I say early, I mean by 7 o'clock at night, oh, and, yeah. and I'm that's always setting them off at that point. So Well, we teach night classes. We do. That's yeah, yes. and Saturdays and all sorts of things, yeah. so it gets difficult. But it, uh, I think, though, it, there's air, you know, we, we have a potential to be exploited if we don't say work, work hours. Now, I think, Cormac, you were mentioning in private conversation um, that there are some bosses who, in, who deal with this management issue by saying, you will be at your desk from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Yeah, PM. I was about to raise that, actually, and I've seen it happen where it's just – because I actually really liked your point about uh, the – the amount of time you should be at work is actually measured by the output, not by the hours, mm. you know, because I'm not paying you for your time, though that might be what the contract says. Well, I'm if you're you a receptionist, you might be. Well, yeah, there are hours that need to be filled, but there are work practices that are evolving, such as flexible work hours yeah. and things like that. Where you, and then now, for example, companies are offering split shifts where sure, yep. you can not only split a role across multiple people, different days, but also across multiple shifts in a single day. Mm. Right. So someone might take especially if now the companies are now forced to, especially if you're working phones and things like that, operate from at least, say, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So right. you've got someone yep. who does the, the 7 a.m. till 3, the 10 till Yeah. Well, hospitals have been doing that with stuff for, yeah, yeah, and places like that. For, yeah, 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 yeah that's but, right. but in terms of actual flexibility, I mean, there's some things I'm not, I can't be flexible about. My Monday afternoon class, I can't just you recall in and go, actually, I'm feeling a bit, you know, like I want to go fishing. Um, Take the class fishing. I didn't fishing. know you, you liked no, going fishing. I, I actually fishing. don't. It was yeah, a really okay. bad example. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Come up with something a bit more realistic. Do you know, I lost my fishing rod two moves ago in terms of how moving has two moves ago, and I only noticed this time around. I said, where's the fishing rod? And they said, we didn't. it didn't come through from the last move. Sorry, oh, Dad. Funny. It's the same with my golf clubs. They're it. still sitting in the back, and I haven't played since the last time I played with my dad. So there's there's a – there's, and that probably says something about my work-life balance. Mm. Um, but I wonder though, if what about the question? Let's raise a different question. Does some companies want you to recreate so that you become a better worker? So they know if you're rested, you'll come back better rested. But rest isn't just about sort of recouping myself enough that I become a good worker on Monday. Rest is something in itself. And not just rest, but what we choose to do in our rest time. So Renee hinted at that when she talked about reading something she enjoys on the on the train or wherever you are. Some that sort of thing, the stuff we do, if you like, not for work, not because someone's paying us to do it, just because we want to. Mm. It's part of our interest. So this idea of, of of leisure and the old Aristotelian idea that leisure is active. That's right. So leisure is not. Sitting in front of the TV watching yeah, the movie. Yeah. In fact, it's yeah. being human. It's, yeah, it's all like, the things yeah. that make us human. Go and do a play. I mean, an old teacher of mine used to say, you go to the opera because it's opera. Now, I haven't quite got that 
particular bug, but I would mm. go to the football because it's football, you know, that's it's just right. because the actual activity of reveling in something that's not specifically getting paid for is in fact a very human mm. thing to do. Yeah, I've got it there, yeah, if I can quote a very wise professor who, who I know and perhaps when I try and imitate him, it might give it away, but he <laughs> says, Cormac, you know that a lot of the time that <laughs> we talk a lot about, you know, a lot of, you know, we need to talk about human beings instead of human doings. Ooh. You know, we, what does it mean to have leisure? You know, he talks yeah. about leisure a lot as being, you know, active contemplation. And he used the example of a rat. That's really, <laughs> really quite interesting. Now, that, you can have to explain how a rat fits into this. Well, he's like, is this, this, oh, he won't be named, but, uh, but he says, We know exactly who he is, by the way. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad it's working. Um, he goes, He would be saying, what's that awful noise coming out of your mouth? <laughs> when you see, I say it in front of him, so it's all right. Um, we're sitting in his courtyard at his house and he says, when I see this rat, that scutters across my, my gutter and climbs up the tree. The rat is generating ratness by doing what a rat does. <laughs> it is consistent <laughs> with the nature of the rat to scutter about, to steal my food, yep. you know, and, and he talks about it and then makes this link to, to what it is to the specific, to the nature and the purpose that tell us, if you like, of human beings, right. that doing things that are consistent with what we're made for. Yep. Yeah. And so. All right. So what, what, what have we lost in that? Because it used to be that the, I mean, I'm saying this fancifully, only having lived in the country as a, as a kid and experienced this, the local people would go to the local play or the local school play or anything because it was the only event in town and mm. it was really fun and interesting and we all got involved and it was a hackville and it was kind of laughable back in when I look back on it. And the local sports team was a hack team, and it was, but it was what everyone did. We've kind of, if you like, made our recreation time into downtime that's either dominated by television programs yes. or Netflix or something like that, or we make it into things that are very much like lock ourselves away, as Renee talked about. Yeah. This is me time. I'm doing this thing. Get away from everyone. And it seems, I don't want a community here. I just want me. And when you I don't talk want to be about on the receiving end of that ever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when you talk about going to hear an orchestra or something, or, or perhaps go to the movies, or you go, it's a big deal. Like it's it's out of the ordinary. Oh well, you get to go to the movies, do you? Mm. Um, and I think. Why isn't it part of our ordinary life that we actually look for and actively involve in? Not not so much, again, it's the perfect being the enemy of the good because going to hear a local thing, if we're used to hearing perfect orchestras through piped music or something like that, we don't do that so much anymore. We don't enjoy it as much anymore. We don't sing around the piano anymore. I don't know if you've ever done that, but my family used to sing around a piano, just yeah. warble and we're all flawed voices, but we had a lot of fun. Mm. Um, that kind of experience is very human. And I wonder if we're losing that to screens and, and piped music and headphones and things like that. Yeah, I wonder if that you'd count the, uh, the rise of the, the smashed Avo and Feta cafe culture that's becoming <laughs> part and parcel of urban life. Because it's something that I wonder with, uh, you go into any you can go anywhere, uh, you know, in, a, in, in an urban environment and you'll find on the weekend on Saturday morning, the cafes are just Back to the rafters right. full of, you know, I think the women are in what, the Lorna Jane active wear. Is that a brand? I don't know. I Whatever have no is. idea. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> I'm just oh, I'm just <laughs> I know what active wear is as a kind of concept. <laughs> I think it looks terrible. Sorry, you're going to have to explain to me what, what's active wear. Oh, you know, like the really tight gym wear that women right. tend to... Well, so you look like you're exercising when you're not. When you're not. That's the point. It's basically, yeah. it's a fashion statement to yeah, say, that's kind oh, of like yeah, that's I'm an so active to person. Yeah. And the guys my are wearing My favourite is that yeah. with stilettos. I see that sometimes <laughs> at my kids' school. You know, so. okay, I don't, <laughs> I don't <laughs> even want to pick that. We're getting, <laughs> we're getting off track here. But the whole point is... These two things do not go together. It's because like work and life. They don't go together. I do like seeing, okay, the cafe culture, that's cool, it's interesting. I used to live in the eastern suburbs, really enjoyed going out on the Saturday morning for, for a coffee. Mm. Everyone else would buy, you know, their, you know, their smashed avo, their eggs benedict kind yep. of thing. And I'd, we can't afford that. We'll just have a coffee, thanks, kind of right. thing. And that was fine. But I used to think, you know, at the, when we first started out going there, oh, yeah, this is just, this is the new culture. This is right. great. Everyone's socializing. It shocked me after a while that I started noticing that people went out and they were sharing their coffees or whatever. And there was silence. Yeah, because they're all on their phones. That's right. No it's one's the art talking of conversation to each other. It's, has it's, been lost. So I'm just it? there going, yeah. well, is that 
It's not yeah. leisure, is it? No. Like you're going out, you're having the experience, but you're just glued to the screen. I'm yeah. like, why are you scrolling through Facebook? You've got this. You have like a human point. person's face right it's in like front of you. <laughs> the Facebook was designed as to replicate the social experience online. Right. Mm, I think you're being but a you, bit optimistic there. I don't think it was designed to do that at all. We think it was designed to do sorry, that. Sorry, I'm quoting the social <laughs> network as the film if anyone's seen it. I'm gonna trust them that they were somewhat accurate in, in Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm I'm with Peter on that one. I'm extremely cynical. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> things to look forward to for me. The things, uh, yes, you will become more cynical. Off. Come back to Hayden's point. You, something's design uh, is you revealed the name now. in its action. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> something's design is revealed in its action. And mm. so when you look at what Facebook actually does, what it's designed to do, where its function leads, I think that tells you what it's designed to do. Mm. Um, there is actually one way of thinking about this whole work-life thing that I think might be getting close to what you're asking about, Peter, with the the whole um, life of contemplation. Excellent. There's an, mm. um, so Cormac knows this well. Within Aristotle, there's actually this tension of what the best kind of life is. Is it the life of the philosopher or is it the life of the politician? And he never really resolves that. Right. But uh, um, Thomas Aquinas picks it up later on. And I go through this with my students. Sorry, we look at... Um, just, sorry, briefly, we probably should explain what he means by the life of a politician because most Aussies hearing this would be seeing, you know, our politicians, which isn't what yeah, they meant. That's that? right. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the same thing with philosophers, by the way. It doesn't He certainly didn't mean the modern academic by no. any so the um So when you have the active and the contemplative life in the way that Thomas Aquinas talks about it, yeah. the idea is that the contemplative life is when you are actually able to work quite hard in trying to understand things. But then there's this moment of wonder where things really connect together and you sit back and you contemplate and you understand something very deep about reality and about your role in reality. So mm. that's the kind of life of contemplation, yep. which is what Aristotle is talking about as well. And then um, the active life, which would be the life of the politician at its best, is where you are active in the community, you're serving and you're being served at the same time and you're involved in talking about what's really important in life yeah. and in, you're involved in helping others to achieve the highest kind of life, which is the life of virtue, where you're doing what you should be doing and you're deeply joyful, which yeah. is a, th a theme of this podcast, deeply joyful about doing what you are yeah. doing. And so you're doing like it with others. It's always with others. So this whole, I guess that's behind a lot of my me time kind of phobia um, yeah. is that it's about a withdrawal rather than an active participation yeah. in community. And we are, Aristotle says it as well, we are, um, we're political. And by that, he means that we are community oriented. Mm, and as soon as you step back from that, then you have issues. There's another thing though, that really drives me crazy. This is like another one of Renee's pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get me to do something at work that isn't work. Like go and spend an hour. Um, thankfully, our corporate culture isn't like this, but I know people who have to go and do paintball <laughs> or, you know, like what? miniature golfing. Is that the trust exercises or, thing where you have to yeah. fall backwards into someone's arms? Yeah, or... and they're usually in IT and yep. it's time that is taken away from their family. Yep. So th and they have to do this as a team building exercise. Yeah. So strike against family life. You're wasting my time when I could be spending it with my family. And this really weird sense that work is not something yeah. that you can actually that can actually bond people together. That you actually need something more. So it feels like a complete waste of yeah. time and energy. And it's this forced frivolity. Yeah. Well, see, so this <laughs> is it. Used, they call them icebreakers in in when you're trying to do the. In meetings the and things like yeah. that. So, or in theatre or whatever. And yeah. It might be the fact that it I'm... It has a role in theatre. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah, if you're trying to loosen up in that sort of sense, sure. And then yeah. I, I know that certain... I've been studying the success of certain sports teams recently and uh, the success is very much about how the players actually relate to each other as human beings. And what's interesting about the attempts, I think they're wrong, the attempts, but what they're trying to do is actually get you to see other workers as human beings rather than just as a function on the other end of this particular work. Yeah, but work. I, I just don't know that it works. So I have a friend who had, doesn't work. had gone completely out of her way to get to a really important meeting, and when she got there, 
um, she'd left her very small children behind mm-hmm. and she'd set them up with colouring in and and blocks and all this kind of thing. She arrives at work and she's told that she needs to sit down and start colouring in and playing with blocks <laughs> with her colleagues what? as one of these, you know, oh, you know, everyone takes work too seriously. And so, we, and she was like, what a complete waste of time. Can I just go home now and do this with my kids, please? Indeed. Because yeah. you have just yep. made huge demands of me and here I am. And yep. wow, what a waste. Seriously. So her, her point was, why am I not sitting down and talking about something really important that would actually make a difference in the workplace? Yep. Um, why is it that I have to act like a kid in order to somehow be taken seriously in this in this work culture? It's is the part of this weird. what is the nature of my relationship? So when yeah. people when people try to force a particular thing on a kind of relationship that's not real, I have a professional relationships at work, which are excellent. And Mm. I get along very well with um, different people. Some of whom I'm very glad to say, I've also get along very well with in other contexts. I I find it helpful to think about leisure in the proper sense as tuning in rather than tuning out. So anything that is taking you away or trying to distract you so much that it has nothing to do with actually thinking and and doing as a human, Mm -hmm. I think is not actually leisure. It's just Mm. distraction. That's a really interesting point because some people actually say that their leisure time is to be able to tune out. But I wonder if they actually mean that. So if I'm – I go swimming with my kids on a Saturday morning and I do laps Mm. um, and there's something in the activity when you actually get going and – I might, may I not be thinking about stuff, mm. <laughs> but it's not a, I don't know, it, it feels deeply human in a way that scrolling through social media doesn't yes. or just yes. kind of vegging yep. out doesn't. Well, it, something it different happens activity. in your brain, actually. Yeah. They've, they've measured this, that when you're watching, it, it's actually there's a big difference because I'm, I've looked at computer games and their effect on us. There's a yeah, huge difference between watching a screen or looking at a screen in terms of what happens in your brain, you, there basically is a very small part of your brain active. This is probably why people think it's tuning out because it is. A very small part of your brain that is active when you're actually just receiving information. You're basically just taking data straight in and there's yeah. there's no filters, there's no actual cognitive process going on here. What's interesting is that when you have to, have to engage with the screen, so if you're, you're involved in a computer game which involves you to various levels, it even the computer game with the exact same screen um, engages you all sorts of cognitive processes that aren't normally engaged and even more actively than you might in a, in the average job. Um, I mean, probably not in ours, but in the average job in terms of the, uh, like I used to, um, this is probably a confession I should, <laughs> I used to lead raids in a, a in a, a, diff, a whole bunch of different MMOs. That's a massively multiplayer online games. And a raid can be up to 40 people coordinating activities over the internet, fighting a big bad boss or something. Now, that kind of level of coordination where you spend an entire night with, you know, something like uh, 16 or 17 massive attempts to kill the big dragon or something, Mm. and it requires that level of coordination, is incredibly intense as an activity. And it compares, intellectually at least, it compares with someone in a sports team planning for, training for, and then running out and, and without really the struggling. physical benefits though. Without the physical benefits, that's another issue. But um, in terms of, um, I I used to play sport a lot and I couldn't once I had a family, which is an interesting point on the whole work-life thing. So I used to play cricket. Cricket's basically your day gone, right? Mm. You go for a six-hour game, but you're there a couple of hours before, you after, yeah, after and you're the to captain. Too, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's a great game and it's a good communal game because you spend a lot of time with people. Anyway. But as soon as I had kids, it just wasn't feasible. Mm. So whereas the online thing, yeah, it might be, uh, you know, some people say you might spend a bit of time on it, but I'm not down the pub playing poker. I'm not out playing sport. I'm still accessible, please God, to my family in other ways. Um, and I haven't gone anywhere. My wife knows exactly where I am. It, And mind you, having said that, there were times when we had to deal with the amount of time I spent on 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 those things. I don't have time anymore. Yeah. And there's, um, in philosophy classes, we often tell our students that if you don't walk out, particularly in metaphysics, if you don't walk out with a headache after three hours, then you haven't been doing your stuff. And to me, that's (laughs) kind of like, because the Greek sense of excellence actually came from athletic excellence. So you push yourself so hard and there's an enjoyment in the pursuit. And Mm. I think that that's actually what leisure looks like. Mm. So it's not people today, I don't know, it's like the nightmare of retirement that I have where you would be in a retirement community where you're not actually actively using your mind and you, you're you not really pushing yourself 
anymore. Yep. Yeah. Um, that it's this kind of cows out to pasture attitude yes. instead of a full involvement mm. in life. And that's, um, yeah, I, I suppose that leisure is actually a, a, a really rich involvement in life. And it might be that I, I'm not particularly fond of opera, but I love drama. Right. So, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. there are all of these different, going to an art gallery where there's a fantastic exhibition going on or just going for a walk out yep, in the bush. Yep. Or, these are all really human activities because they're all meaning focused, but they're not, um, and they draw us further and further into what this amazing world is all about rather than sure. checking us out. Somehow. Yeah, because yeah. I find that fascinating because one of the things that – so my my wife and I, for example, we uh, have very different attitudes to leisure. So if one of us is a free morning kind of thing and, you know, we don't say me time, but sometimes you need to have a break and that's right. fine. So it's like, well, what do you want to do? I will happily take myself down for a walk, end up at a cafe perhaps, grab a coffee, read the paper – or read a book, yeah. or just sit there and think, yeah, and contemplate. And I, I, and I naturally slip into that state all the time. Yeah. There was a, a, a phase where we were walking the kids to in the pram at night because it was the only way we could get them to sleep. And the starlight up in the Blue Mountains is just Gorgeous. magnificent. And I would just, I'd walk into poles and things because I'd just, be, <laughs> I'd be looking up and just. You really going, are a philosopher. Yeah, so, so, but, so but it's just did you see the stars before you walked into the pole, yeah. or just after? There were a lot more after. I've got to say, and I'm like, I thought stars were constant anyway. <laughs> but but uh, but you haven't I fallen say, down a well yet. That no, was what the right. first philosophy. But, my, <laughs> but, my, but when but when my wife uh, when I say oh you've got uh, a bit of time uh, why don't you go for a walk sit at a cafe she goes I am not going to waste my time <laughs> my one chance I'm like oh okay um, what do you want to do and for her real leisure is when is basically real physical activity. Yeah. She right. loves yeah. trekking. She loves bushwalking. And yep. to the point though, and her idea of it is where the walk is, is so, is grueling and excruciating that every thought or worry or care about the world that you're not escaping from, but, but this is where your the activity you're engaged in, you're so completely focused on the making that next hill yes. that yeah. you don't, yep worry about anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All you're doing is totally 100% engaged yeah. in the activity yeah. and then you get to the top of the hill and you get to sit back yes. yeah. and just breathe. And yeah. there's a sense of achievement in that too because yeah, you've actually absolutely. you've striven against some sort of goal, uh, some sort of adversity and you've achieved something. See, this is what I find in sport. A sport is one of these things where the striving and, and even if you fail, like I, I was in a team that lost many games and then eventually started to win uh, and won very well at the end. But the losing was actually an incredible um, learning journey as well. Mm. And and if, you know, my brief attempt at rock climbing, um, which ended in much losing. Um, <laughs> many I stars. Kept, I kept falling in many <laughs> stars. Yes, it was top roping, thankfully, because thankfully, I fell quite a lot. Mm. But, it's something um, about getting in the zone though, isn't yeah. it? Isn't mm. it? Yeah. yeah, you just – you. It's a kind of forgetfulness that is actually yeah, deeply yes. entrenched in meaning, if I can mm. put it that is it, way. This is interesting. You forget all sorts of other sort of fripperies, but you're really focused yeah. on mm. something. So uh, is it a personality type, though? Because I'm, my wife, my wife's hobby is sleeping. She loves to sleep, and she has a superpower that if we got in a lift that went for 16 floors, she could probably have a nap on the way up, right? Well. I'm, I'm, a per- <laughs> I'm a person who, who can't, like, I really struggle to sleep, so every night I have to have a very careful wind-down routine mm. to get my head yeah, in a space to sleep. And and, um, you know, it's an anxiety thing, I think. But um, the the issue with recreation is that if someone tells me to just sit and think, I will literally destroy myself in my own head. Like I'm a melancholic. It will just tear myself to bits. I have to have an activity that engages me thoroughly that I can throw myself into and really enjoy. Now, in a sense, it's a very big balance. Uh, you know, it's a big question of balance between my wife and I to, in order to stay married for 20-something years because – I have to respect the, how she relaxes at the same time as challenging her a little bit to, to, you know, to come out of that little box. And she has to challenge me to relax sometimes because I'm, I just keep throwing myself into things. And that's when it's the only thing you're doing, it can be unhealthy. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. So is there a, are there people who simply just don't want to, like some people, I'm sure, listening to this, th- Renee, thinking, if I have to think every time I... She's just mad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to think every time I relax, it's just going to be no, hell. But, but what <laughs> do people do? I mean, it's not that I'm thinking about thinking, but I'm thinking about something. So there's usually right. some kind of 
problem <laughs> that is eating away at me. And it's usually something to do with Augustine because I've usually uh, got some actual academic work I need to be doing. Mm, so I've actually yep. gotten into the habit of just enjoying spending a few minutes saying, now, where was I with thinking through that problem? Because I've got to write that paper. Right. <laughs> yeah, have, you ever, have you ever seen, there's a guy, a, a psychologist and um, and comedian, I think, called Mark Gungor. Have you ever heard no, him talk yeah, about yeah, relationships? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know the one I'm talking about? Hilarious. If you look anyway, up, yep. If you look up the nothing box or yes. men and women's brains on YouTube, you'll see this this clip. I'll try and I'll try and find it and throw it up in case it, you know, we better check Mike to see if it's copyrighted. But basically, his thing is that guys, and he's talking typical guys here because it doesn't apply to me. But he says guys have a nothing box. He says guys think with boxes. Now, just for the listener, I don't agree with this theory as exclusive to men, but he is describing a very common trait between men and women's relationships. Uh, women's thoughts tend to be connected. You know, mother-in-law is connected to the car. Everything else is connected, and and it, it all sort of runs on an energy called emotion. Um, but in, in the slightly more predominant trait in men is that they have boxes. So if you want to talk about your mother-in-law, you pull out the mother-in-law box and you talk about what's in that box, and then you put it back, and then you talk about the next box. And one of the boxes is a nothing box. And he he says that the most frequent thing that comes up with him in counseling is when the woman says, he won't tell me what he's thinking. And he, and the Mark Ungor says, well, how do you know? And they say, because when, when I say, what are you thinking? He says, nothing. <laughs> now he says, men can actually do this. They've measured this using ECGs and not ECGs. Um, What's the brain scan one? It isn't an ECG or EG. It's the ECG is anyway. a cardiogram, which is CT. a heart. Oh, okay. So oh. Um, okay. whatever the brain scan one is, um, and they've, they've latched it up to men, and men are capable of having a purely baseline level of thought and still live. <laughs> Where, and it's, it's from the hunter thing, isn't it? Where I, whereas gathering is just so much more involved. And his yeah. theory is that's why <laughs> men are into fishing and things like that. It was, it was if, and the reason why fishing was a bad analogy for me is that I sit there and fishing and as soon as I've thrown the line in, I'm thinking, I wonder, What's if, I, wonder if I could treat it. I wonder, <laughs> if I, I wonder if I put the right bait on it. So it's constantly, <laughs> and, and my wife's the opposite. So this is yeah. why it's amusing. She mm. has the, the, she wants to just sit sometimes. Whereas I'm always thinking. So if I sit down beside her, it'll be a maximum of five minutes before I say, have you ever thought about, you know, and, and she stop it. <laughs> so I, I mean, I don't know the, the whole nothing box thing. I think there are some people who do enjoy not thinking. Yeah. I'm just not but sure. But eventually they're going to start thinking again. I agree. I think you, you can sit down and say, okay, whew, but then something's going to come up. Actually, I think that we don't spend enough time doing that. Just saying, doing okay, giving I, yourself space yeah, to think. Yeah, just giving yourself you space to think and, okay, I'm I'm just going to sit here. Pascal has this great saying where he says that he thinks that a lot of, um, so Blaise Pascal, who lived around the same time as Descartes, said that a lot of life's problems would be solved if people knew how to sit quietly by themselves in their room. Right. And I bring mm. that up a lot with my students so, and say to them, do you ever do that? Do you ever sit down without any social media and without anyone around for just five minutes even? And I'm not talking about some kind of Eastern meditation stuff here. Just no. like sit and be. Um, do you ever do that? And a lot of them, or, I mean, most of them uh, would say no, but it's the mm. first time that they've thought about it as that's a human thing to do. Mm. To and it gives you space to actually reflect on yeah. things. Now, and something will pop up that you might not have been addressing, you know, that kind of niggling thing that actually needs to be brought in the open. And if we have a role... At which at all requires us to think about and plan ahead or be creative about how to make the, the, the what we're doing better at work, that thinking time actually becomes a, a very useful and, and constructive part of our work time, I think, mm. in the sense like I often feel guilty if I've just been sitting in my office thinking about a strategy to, you know, promote a particular degree or, you know, promote something else because I think oh, I haven't done anything today. But actually what I've done is give myself enough space where the creativity could actually happen and a whole yeah. bunch of ideas could bounce around and mm -hmm. it ends up resulting in something quite a lot better than if I just ran around in activity. So maybe you just... Going back to Renee's point, you maybe your problem is just the paradigm shift that needs to happen. You need to get out of the work and life of separation and Thank go. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Actually, I, look, as the as the independent panel member here with no skin in the game, yeah, I'm here right. about to declare. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, that brings us to uh, a point uh, as we get towards the end of this discussion. What about Catholic employers? Now, as Catholics, we can talk about how we manage our own employment and how we are good workers and how we might uh, – give good bang for bang for buck for our contribution to the mm. – which includes, of course, contemplation and our whole person can be being engaged in the workplace. Um, from an employment perspective, if we happen to find ourselves as Catholics in charge of staff or, or 
setting up policies and organizational things, the sort of things, what are the sort of things we would think about in terms of making life, uh, making a workplace more work-life friendly, if I can use the phrase, in terms of families and, and their whole person being brought to the workplace? Mm. Yeah, because that's, I guess, we go back to a lot of the, the Catholic social teaching and, and John mm. Paul II talking about, well, what are the living conditions associated with employment? So sure. does the level of wage adequately support um, the ability to provide for one's family and to own, you know, uh, at mm. least a, a modest uh, establishment where you can house your family and things like That's that? That's an interesting point because almost always the wages are set in our modern context on um, what you produce. So what value do you add to the company? But the Catholic um, social teaching ignores that completely it's well obviously it says you have to, you can only pay what you're able to pay mm. but it says the the level of pay should be based on what that person needs in order to thrive and it's something i actually quite i grapple with because i read you know i'm a, I'm a huge john paul ii fan right. you know, as anyone kind of knows if they see me crossing the street kind of thing but <laughs> I, I i don't I, I, I'm not actually all that comfortable with, or at least I, fully, I don't fully understand or appreciate yet the Catholic position on the point of an employer being responsible for paying uh, an employee a wage that they can provide for their family. I just, may, yeah, it might be a product of my era or whatever, but I, I think you are. I just, I, <laughs> I, I, honestly, I just look at how businesses, you know, really like the overwhelming majority of businesses are small businesses, which yep. means they're producing, they're turning over less than $2 million a year, employing up mm -hmm. to 20 people. And, uh, I just, you know, my, my in-laws own a, a small business and I, I just look at, you know, they pay people, you know, a very fair amount of money, but I just can't see how you could reasonably say, well, yep, yeah, I'm going to, it's my responsibility, like as in government legislation mandates that yep. I am responsible for paying you enough so that you can buy your house. Yeah, so you I, I, don't, I think your... we're looking at two different questions there. One yep. of them is government legislation. Mm. What we're talking about here is the is as a Catholic employer, how we would go about it to now what when we, we talked about this with religious freedom a couple of episodes ago. We want to actually separate the idea of the government legislating that everyone has to behave this way. Mm. And as Catholics, how does that influence our, our activity as employers? Because I think that's a different thing. It's a, that's a choice we make, which reflects our worldview and, and our, our ethics. Well, I think it's, this, I think you run into the same problem because a Catholic businessman operating in Australia still has to operate under the same market constraints as everyone else. They do. And if they run an unviable business because they can't afford to pay everyone this Catholic yep. idea of how much they're supposed to pay, do they go out of business? Yep. And then, so, so, so what, let me I put just, it this that's way. what I'm trying to understand. I think it's a problem of the, I think the immorality of this situation is in the system and it, it puts all of us in a situation where we're almost shoehorned into an immoral treatment of workers in general. Now it's possible to do what you can within a system to do it. But if I was in a situation, a hypothetical world somewhere else, not on this planet where there were slaves, right? And I morally decided having a slave is actually immoral and I won't do it. So mm. I'm going to do my, um, uh, my crops with paid workers. I'm going to pay them enough to live, et cetera. I'm not going to be able to compete with all the slave owners around me. I'm, in fact, I'm probably going to have to really, really, really struggle to make ends living. Uh, sorry, make ends meet. That doesn't change the moral issue involved with the, the way we treat workers and the way we treat people. And it, but it, what it does do is have a look at the entire system and say, maybe we need to look a bit broader than just my activities here. And maybe my struggle to be moral in that situation isn't a bad struggle. It's a heroic struggle. It might be difficult, but it doesn't mean I should make a decision to go, oh, well, give up. Let's just go with slaves then. It's not practical to not have slaves. I think that there's the whole issue of a just wage, and that might be one thing, but there are actually practical ways in which people within Catholic institutions can make a difference if they have any role in management, for instance. Yes. So mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest things that we can do as a Catholic work culture is is – make family welcome in all sorts of ways. So um, within our school, so within our department at the university, children are always, 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 always welcome. So it might be the case that they even have to come to class sometimes. Yes. So I've been known to turn up to class with a <laughs> newborn baby because there was no other option at the mm -hmm. time. It was either mm -hmm. I walk into the classroom or she was, um, she was six weeks old, I suppose. Um, everyone still remembers 
Yep. My little girl, who's now seven, yep. um, because Students she would squawk. Yeah, they still ask children. for her. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and it's lovely. So during school holidays, we usually have kids on the floor. And I just think that's wonderful. It because is. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I agree. And, and I always tell work, uh, tell colleagues, if they come in and they're worried about their work-life balance, to use that horrible phrase, you know, <laughs> I've got this thing going on. There's an urgent medical appointment, but I should be at my desk. I'm like, well, what do you mean you have to be at your desk? Go to your yes, medical yes, appointment. Yes, are we, yes. Why are we even having this conversation? <laughs> um, yep. So just that, that kind of thing. And also talking about hours. So if someone comes in and says, look, I'm working tonight, but yep. just so you know, I'll be in a little bit later tomorrow morning. Great. Mm, Things yep. like that, just to, like on the go, being very flexible. I yep. think if we can be open in ways like that, then that's, we can, we can talk about, you know, the government wage system and the, you know, all of these things over which we have no control, but there are actually little ways in which mm. we can have, a, we can make a difference. I think in a, in a Catholic institution too, there should always be, if there's mass nearby, um, or it, that, Go to it's mass. A, it's a no-brainer again. You go to mass. So you might be 10 minutes over your lunch break. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, there are just things that are more important. As long as you, mm. again, if there's a genuine consciousness of your effect on other people and you've made the effort to to make it up in other areas, it doesn't matter. No. Like it's, it's not a big issue, deal. However, I mean, as we're wrapping this up, I'd, I'd like to make the point that in the past, there have been systemic injustices in society. Um, which have affected Catholics sometimes specifically, like when only in the 1950s we had ads in newspapers that said uh, for jobs, Catholics need not apply because they Mm. didn't trust the Catholics. Or you can go back into some of the places in New York and you'll find Irish not don't need to apply or something. So there's a there's a there's been that sort of thing around. And what the Catholic response has been is that a whole bunch of Catholics got together and formed things like the the Knights in here, Knights of the Southern Cross, or what were they, the Knights of Columbus? Is it in the states? Um, something like that. In other words, they basically formed organizations to simply collectively address the injustice. Mm. And they, they didn't try to take on the government. They just provided jobs for people um, or, help, you know, tried to work towards that. Now, I think um, we're in a situation where um, the work-life balance is not great. So if someone has to make a decision to move to another occupation, we just simply try to encourage as many people as possible to be good managers. We, t- yeah. we train, mm. we, we, if you like, uh, without even trying to make everyone Catholic, we simply spruik the 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 gospel that is treat your workers well, and they want to stay in your organisation, and they want to work hard because they they're invested in what you're doing. Uh, does that sound yeah. fair? Yeah. Yep. What are your thoughts on the concept of a, a a UBI or a universal basic income as uh, the digital age and technology really disrupts the modern economy. It's going to be so disruptive. You know, we've had other disruptions like the industrial revolution and things like that. But the idea is that this time round, it's going to be so disruptive that actually pretty much every job is going to be automated, that machines will just do everything and there'll be no need for people to work, or at least there will not be enough jobs for the number of people that we have. So to float the idea that the government will then provide a basic income for everyone. Right. And so you don't have to work and you're free to then do the things in life that are meaningful, you know, meaningful if you want. You know, but, and so I guess one of the, the criticisms of the concept of a UBI is that work itself can be inherently meaningful. Yeah. And it can be, it is. Personal. It's well, an essential element of being that's human. That's what I wanted to ask you about. And so what are your thoughts on a well, UBI? Is it? We'll come back to John Paul too. He, he, he talks about work as being one of the ways we leave our fingerprint, our imprint on the, the world and the fact that we're actually participating in the creator's work by, by leaving our unique imprint on things. Now, work is not necessarily paid work, but of course, having some kind of meaningful contribution to society is an essential element of it. I'm not so convinced we're going to lose the capacity to have everyone work because the, the basic needs which had us all working haven't gone away. And even if they think machines are going to cope with all those basic needs, I think they they might be yeah, I think we might be in a bit of trouble there if we go that way. Yeah. We've kind of got something closer than other countries 
here in Australia because we have new start allowance for those who are out of work. We have um, pensions for those who are, you know, we have, in other words, we have certain. It's not exactly the same. Though. It's, no, it's yeah. not it's the more, same. And it's seen more as welfare payments, mm. it, whereas the, this would be something that everyone is entitled to yes. well, just be by being a member of society. Not just entitled to, you would get it if you wanted it or not. Right. Yeah. Not only that, there'd be zero expectation or zero concept. There'd be no fostering in, in schools or in universities or in workplaces of yep. any sort of ambition or, you know, desire to work hard. It depends or, or how much money anything. there was really in it. Because well, that, well, again, is it economically viable? And where is it coming from? Where's the money coming the, from? And that's the kind of thing is See, the there new, all kinds of Well, this, this has come up recently with the New Start thing. Um, the New Start payments simply aren't enough to live on, right? And some people say, well, I think what you've said, which is if people are getting enough money to live on for a New Start, why would they then go and work if they get roughly the same amount of money, except there's a huge amount of effort in it? Mm. You know, if I'm, and especially when I'm getting treated like rubbish in one of the low-end jobs, I, I just don't want to do it. However... The other argument is if you pay them slightly less, it's an incentive. They don't starve, but it's an incentive for them to get out and do some work because there's more money in work kind of thing. Um, I'm not, I've seen what happens when you have to live on welfare. My father was very ill and we, for five, at least five years, we lived off sickness benefits. And the answer was we didn't live off sickness benefits. We had to, we fortunately had some land and we were able to grow our own stuff and work towards that. But if there were people in the same position as us who couldn't live, they literally had to do either something illegal or they had to just cut corners, which were to do with their health or to the, their, you know, their children's mm. upbringing or things like that. Um, it's not... There is a balance, I think, between the justice due to someone who's genuinely trying to work or trying to find some way to be productive, or there's some incapacity there, like no fault of their own. There's some sort of um, mental struggle or there's there's a physical struggle and they can't do the kind of work people are asking of them. Um, we probably need to have a whole other episode on the whole automation thing. That I think that's a big question and, we, mm. and, and whether machines can take people's jobs. And part of it is that we're just not paying people to do worthwhile things anymore. Imagine, I mean, if we paid people to do Shakespearean plays in our local area, there'd be work for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> not everyone is a good Shakespearean actor. Right? Yes, but, I'm yeah. so, but someone has Amen. to. Someone Somebody, ha somebody has to do it. Well, they have to, <laughs> someone has to set the chairs up. Someone has to, you know, sweep oh, yeah, the floor. Someone has to yeah. organize the things. In yeah. other words, if we paid for what was good for humanity instead of just what makes some company profit, mm. that it, you know, the, I think the then we get into all sorts of arguments about whether what is actually what good is for worthwhile. humanity. And I yeah. think this is a discussion that we'll never get to the bottom of. <laughs> no, that. that's right. <laughs> What's your point? <laughs> I think I think some discussions are worth happening, and not getting to the the end of the discussion is actually a success. Um, all right, we probably should get to the point where we actually do some of this wondering we've been talking about. Mm. Um, the one minute wonder for today. So, Renee, off to you. So, in my travels, I picked up a book in the airport, which was called "When Breath Becomes Air," and it's yes. by someone named Paul. K Kalanithi, Kalanithi. Um, and he is a neurosurgeon. So he studied literature, became a neurosurgeon, then was diagnosed with cancer. And he is a beautiful writer and he writes about his whole life story, growing up as a kid in Arizona, dealing with rattlesnakes, um, making it out of a low socioeconomic demographic into the education system, getting this literature degree, realising that he really wanted to understand the connection between brain and mind and keeping on going. Anyway, they're just these beautiful moments within the actual text. It's quite a moving text, just talking about what it means to be a really good doctor. And at a certain moment, he talks about the nature of disaster. And this was my moment of wonder. Disaster, etymologically, means a star breaking apart. <laughs> and when I heard that, when I read that, I thought, that is amazing. And the, the line came to me uh, from Wisdom, I believe, when they left, their going seemed like a disaster. So when someone dies, it does seem like a star has mm. just shattered. And so that was my moment of wonder. There you go. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's really Deep. I'm going to actually think, go away and think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. When I walk into a pole and <laughs> <That's right. laughs> see your stars exploding. <laughs> see the stars. <laughs> oh, disaster. Yeah. And I'll laugh to myself because it'll be a whole new meaning. Um, yeah, my one minute wonder is, 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 is pretty simple, actually. I, I was thinking about the, the beauty of Catholic rituals uh, and, uh, and I read something about, you know, trying to foster uh, prayer and family life uh, in, in the family home. And tried to make the connection that uh, 
well, what if we brought rituals into the home? And this article was talking about, you know, how kids learn mm. well about their faith life through the active participation in rituals. So when we do evening, our evening prayers before they go to bed, we don't just sit down and pray. We strike a match, light the candle, right. turn the lights down. Mm -hmm. The boys each get to blow out a match. I have to light it twice. Um, and <laughs> you know, they each get a little, a prayer book that they get to hold. Uh, and there's things that they can engage that they can touch and they can feel. And I just thought that, well, isn't the, like, they, they just love it. You know, the, the children who just like dive into this stuff. And I thought, isn't the mass just such a ritual that's just childlike? Yes. Mm. You know, we're just being drawn in with our sensations. You know, you can smell the incense. You can yep. watch the thurible flying, the stained glass windows, catching all the yep. light and fragmenting it in different ways. And it's just, it's so immersive yeah. that to me, it's just such a, I, I don't know, I just wanted to marvel at yeah. just how childlike mass was yes. when really elevated. If you go to a, a solemn high mass, especially, mm. Yeah, that was a lot. I can't remember if I've told you this, but there was a Russian Orthodox priest and I went to visit once to the, the mass and I had a, because I was a Lutheran at the time, I had a go at him about how many pictures were on the wall, you know, the icons. I called them pictures and he was offended. But um, I said, doesn't this distract your parishioners? And he said, I'm not so arrogant as to believe that they're only able to hear the word of God from me. If a child is distracted, he looks over there and mm -hmm. St. Peter gives him a homily in colours. <laughs> wow! Bam! And, and ever yeah. since then, I've just wanted there to be a, a richness of sensations yes. in in every kind of learning experience, and especially the mass. That's a great one, Cormac. Um, in terms of my one wonder, it was about language. I actually dropped one of my favourite lines in in uh, one of my ancient uh, culture classes to do with the background of scripture, and talked about how language changes our way of thought. And I mentioned this research that I've read recently, where certain European languages if you know them, they dispose you to be slightly better at certain tasks. Mm -hmm. So German has, um, it, on average, with all the controls are involved, German makes you 5 to 10% better at math. Um, French, that would have been my guess. Yeah, yeah. French okay. was 5 to 10% better at the humanities, and English, counterintuitively, is 5 to 10% better at logic. Which is the most, the least logical language I actually know. <laughs> but it's okay. yeah, you have to understand the illogicality <laughs> yeah. of the, thing, yeah, the but, logic. Yeah. But I, no. as an exercise preparing for this class, I was just sitting there thinking and wondering, do I think in English exclusively now? And I don't. I think in concepts from other languages, because there's about six or seven languages floating around in my head. And some things you can't say in English yeah. or they yes. take an entire sentence that. in English to capture one Hebrew word yeah. or one yeah. Greek word or Spanish or Italian or whatever. And I've just been having a go at French just casually recently. And I'm starting to think in French phrases just because I'm forcing myself to think about things. Mm. And I realized I can't actually say that in English. It's not possible. <laughs> and then I realized that has affected, it made me realize it's affected something I just wrote in my thesis. The way I phrased it in English was affected by my thoughts in, in, cool. in French, which I thought, okay, that's, that's so cool <laughs> in the sense yeah, that my yeah, brain yeah. is actually changing because of the language. It's not just about learning a different set of sounds and symbols. It's really cool. Yeah. Anyway. I like it. Yeah. All right. That's it, it for this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking and arguing with your podcast device, let us know. You can subscribe to the podcast at our website, thiscatholiclife.com.au. You can tell us what you liked or what you didn't like or what you would like us to discuss in a future show by dropping us a line at info at thiscatholiclife.com.au or you can join the discussion um, by joining our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Discord chat. And you can find all the links on the show notes on our website. Um, please do, if you like what you've heard here, this is a uniquely Catholic Australian podcast. We think that's a great idea. And please review us on iTunes. Remember, you have to sign into iTunes and review us. Um, you'll find the link to the iTunes under our podcast notes. Leave us a review, and if enough people get reviewed, then we, the word gets out a little bit uh, more efficiently. So tell your friends. Before we go, it's time for shout-outs. Cormac. I'd actually like to do a quick shout-out to, uh, to school teachers especially who really try and impart the faith on the, on the students. Uh, my brother's a school teacher, and I know he has a really rough time of it uh, and uh, I just wanted to, to say that as my children approach school age and we're starting to think about schools and where to go, it's a, it's, we didn't think about, it was in the subconscious of our mind that it was a really important value that we'd like the faith to be a really important part of their education. But mm. now that we're sort of thinking, oh, okay, where are they going? 
that's really like right at the top of the list. So appreciate you know all those teachers who who make it possible for us to consider your school. <laughs> <laughs> Renee. So my shout out is to the Notre Dame students who have just started up in the second semester this year. I had the great joy of walking into a classroom for only an hour the other day and it was great. We were talking about the philosophy of the human person. We ended up talking about robots and, you know, all sorts of other interesting things. And I I just think that our students are amazing in the way that they approach issues and are unafraid of the truth. So big shout out to all of them. Fantastic. Um, my shout out goes to those managers out there who are trying really hard to be decent folk and they're dealing with all the regulations and the pressures from their businesses and profits, margins and everything. Keep trying because it actually does make a difference. Uh, there's a huge amount of evidence to show. And anecdotally, we can say if you've got a manager who you know is trying, then it actually makes it worth the effort. So keep trying and uh, keep your chin up and you, people will appreciate you even if they're sometimes a little grumpy at work. I'm looking at, to my right here. <laughs> um, that's all for now. I'm on the left, by the way. <laughs> I'm the person I've who's always, a little bit grumpy I've always heard that about you, Cormac, yeah, yeah. on the left. Um, <laughs> Managers of meat in the sandwich. Never forget that. <laughs> yes. I'm a vegan. Yeah, you always... <laughs> You always think you're going no, to get no, to the no. managerial level and change the world, and then you get there and you realise how much, how yeah. little you actually that's why have control I of. To emphasize little changes, little changes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Next week we'll be chatting about the morality of mortgages and how they affect us. So it's going to be fun. But that's all for now. Thank you for listening to this Catholic Life. 